Okay, so I'll uh, give you another idea that was recently developed by one of my students, Vivek, uh, on evicted address filter. And this is again another idea. Uh, the, the idea here is to uh, get rid of both pollution and trashing at the same time. And we've covered thrashing, but we haven't covered pollution. So be, uh, the idea is to be more intelligent about what to put into cache and where to put in the cache. So a briefly summary, there are two problems that degrade cache performance. One is pollution, the other is thrashing. And I'll describe these more in more detail. And prior works don't address both problems concurrently. I'll cover some prior works also in this. But first, let me ensure that uh, Microsoft w uh, does not have its own mind. There you go. OK. Now I can't control instead of the <laughs> PowerPoint controlling me. OK. So the goal is to have a mechanism to address both problems, pollution and thrashing. Uh, so the solution we'll, I'll describe is the evicted address filter cache. And this idea, again, is applicable to many different, any place where you employ caches. Uh, and it, ha it will have low overhead. Uh, the idea is to keep track of recently evicted block addresses in a filter, separate filter, separate from the cache, and insert low reuse blocks with low priority to mitigate cache pollution. Basically, these recently evicted block addresses will uh, form a reuse predictor. If you actually access blocks that are recently evicted, you're going to predict that they're going to be high reuse. Otherwise, you're going to predict that everything uh, Everything that's not within this filter is going to be low reuse. And we're going to put that into the cache with low priority, such that they don't pollute the cache. Everything else we will put with high priority if something hits there. And we're going to clear evicted address filter periodically to mitigate trash. That's the idea. And this will have low complexity implementation using a bloom filter. And we've, uh, we've seen that this outperforms five uh, state-of-the-art approaches to address pollution or thrashing. Let's take a look at uh, what, so this is, cache utilization is important because we don't want to access memory. There's a lot of energy inefficiency and bandwidth consumption that happens over there. As we put more cores, it becomes even more important. Well, because of all these reasons. You have large latency, low bandwidth, and increasing contention here. Uh, the different blocks actually have different reuse behavior. And we're going to try to distinguish between those blocks. So let, let me t give you an example as to uh, how, how these blocks behave. This will be similar to this. Let's see if our colors will work. Assume an access sequence like this. These blocks, which are supposed to be in red, have actually higher reuse, right? Because uh, they're, they're being reused a lot. Where these blocks are low reuse. Now they're blue. So for the rest of the presentation, these are red and these are blue. Ideally, you would like to keep the red blocks into the cache, right? Because these are not going to be reused according to this access sequence. Uh, cache pollution refers to the problem that low reuse blocks evict high reuse blocks. So if you have a cache like this, if you use LRU policy, this is what happens. The blue blocks that are low reuse evict these high reuse red blocks. Prior work has taken the approach of predicting the reuse behavior of these missed blocks and inserting low reuse blocks at LRU position. So if you figure out that blocks are low reuse, you insert them at LRU position. Which makes sense, right? That way, these low reuse blocks disturb the high reuse blo blocks less. And we're going to use that uh, idea. Cache thrashing refers to the problem of high reuse blocks evicting each other, just like here. This could be very high reuse, right? A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, but they evict each other. As a result, you get 0% hit rate with LRU. So these are high reuse blocks, but they don't fit into the cache. As a result, what happens is they evict each other. Prior work tried to solve this problem with what I described earlier. You inserted MRU, most recently used position, with very low probability. This is called the bimodal insertion policy. And you insert at least recently used policy with a very high probability. That way, you get to keep most of your working set in the cache. So you become more trash resistant. And this is the pictorial depiction of it. Basically, you keep inserting at the LRU position, which means that you're keeping a lot of the blocks in the cache. And, but sometimes you insert at the MRU position also so that you recycle the blocks. You adapt to working set changes. So, but there are shortcomings to these prior works. Basically, we don't, uh, these don't address both pollution and thrashing concurrently. Basically, if you look at the works on cache pollution, 
they don't control the number of blocks inserted with high priority into the cache. If you look at the prior work on cache thrashing, uh, and as a result, if you, if you do this, they don't handle cache thrashing, right? Because for cache thrashing, you need to control the number of blocks that are inserted with high priority into the cache. Otherwise, you would be thrashing. The problem happens because you insert every block with high priority. As a result, you thrash your cache. Uh, prior work on cache thrashing, they don't distinguish between high reuse and low reuse blocks. So they don't do the thing that these works on cache pollution do. So we're going to try to get the best of both worlds here. Design a mechanism that addresses both cache pollution and thrashing concurrently. So the idea is evicted address filter. So we're going to do reuse prediction. Whenever we get a cache miss, we're going to classify the block as high reuse versus low reuse dynamically. Uh, so one option for doing this is keep track of the reuse behavior of every cache block in the system, every, cache, every possible cache block in memory. And people have actually tried to look at this, and they've seen that this is impractical because it has very high storage overhead and high lookup latency. So we don't want this. Uh, pr other prior works used program counter or memory region information. Basically, they classified cache blocks. For example, you can group blocks based on which program counter, which load actually brought those blocks. If this load has brought these blocks, you're going to predict high reuse or low reuse based on the load address, uh, load uh, program counter. And similarly, for another load, you can have a different prediction. Or you can have, uh, well, you can, you can also use the memory region information. For this region of memory, we're going to predict low reuse or high reuse. That way, you can reduce the overhead. And they learn the group, group behavior. You can learn this group actually has high re, uh, low reuse, this group has low reuse. Remember, red is black, or black is red, for, for the purposes of this presentation. Is this black different from this black from the back? OK, yes, this black is red. This black is not red. This is gray, I think. <laughs> OK, and then we're going to predict reuse, basically. Whenever you get uh, program counter one, we're going to predict uh, this is high reuse. Whenever we get program counter two, this, go, this is uh, the blocks that are loaded by program counter two, this load, are low reuse. So we find that same group doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same reuse behavior, because a load may uh, load two different blocks that have different reuse behavior, depending on the conditions, right? Conditional branches. And also, this, these policies that have no control over number of high reuse blocks. Uh, so our approach is per block prediction. We don't want to group blocks because of this reason. So we want to have a per block predictor. And the idea is to have use the recency of eviction to predict reuse. So if you look at this, whenever block is evicted from the cache, it can be accessed soon after eviction. In this case, this could be a high reuse block. Right? Let's see. Or you can have another block that is evicted here. And it could be accessed long time after the eviction. In this case, we're going to predict this as a low reuse block. And that's going to be blue. And this is going to be red. So we're going to use this time of eviction, how, how, how far ahead the time of eviction was as a predictor of reuse of that block. So if you look at this, the, the idea is simple afterwards. right? You have this evicted address filter. You have this cache. We're going to have, keep the addresses of recently evicted blocks in a separate structure. When we get an evicted block address, we're going to insert into this EAF structure. When a cache miss happens, when you get a miss in the cache, we're going to check this EAF. If it's an EAF, we're going to predict that it has high reuse, and we're going to insert it with high priority into the cache. If it's not an EAF, then we're going to predict that it has low reuse because it wasn't accessed, it was accessed a long time ago, or it was never accessed before. We're going to insert that low priority. That's the basic idea. Uh, so naive implementation will have full address tags, basically. For each block that's evicted, you'll have full address tags. This leads to large storage overhead and associative lookup. Somehow we need to search this. And it also uh, is, you, not need, you really need not to be uh, accurate 100%, right? Because this is a predictor. If you realize these, you can actually implement EAF as something that is much simpler, which is a bloom filter. So this has low storage overhead and uh, low energy overhead. Uh, is everybody familiar with bloom filters here? Yes, some, not everyone. OK, I'll still go over it then, because not everyone's familiar. So bloom filter is actually a beautiful uh, structure. Uh, it's, mm, it's a paper by Bloom 
uh, in CACM 1970. And I'd recommend that paper. It's a very theoretical paper. But the idea is we would like to represent a set of elements in a compact way, in an approximate way. We would like to, uh, we don't want a representation that is a very uh, large overhead. So basically, you can start with a bit vector, right? You have this bit vector. So uh, I guess one, uh, let's say you have a set of elements. Uh, one way of representing a set of elements is you have all potential elements, and you can have a bit associated with each saying that, does this element exist in the set? Right? It could be 1 or 0, 1 or 0. Right? You could have a, a, a bit per element saying the element exists or doesn't exist. Now this has a lot of storage overhead, and this is very exact, right? This is an exact representation. If you have lots of potential elements that can go into the set, then this can be very high cost. And in this case, the potential elements are all of the elements that are potentially evicted. So we're going to keep, make this uh, bit vector smaller. So we're going to have, a, I guess it doesn't work when I write on top of what I've written before. We're going to make this bit vector smaller and map the addresses to these bits so that there could be collisions, there could be aliasing between the addresses. That's the idea. So it's a compact bit vector. We don't have a bit per element, but we have some number of bits that we're going to map the elements to. And one means the element is present, zero means the element is absent. So the same two elements, two different elements can map to the same location, which means that even though one, only one of the elements is present, you may think that the other element is also present. So it's, it's not necessarily correct, right? But it's approximate. So it has false positives. So let's take a look at uh, a more realistic implementation of this. You have this bit vector that indicates presence or absence of elements. And we have a set of hash functions that we are going to use to map the elements to. So we're not going to use one bit to indicate the presence of an element, but we're going to use multiple bits. So when we get an address, when we're going to insert an element, we take its address, let's say this element x, we go through a hash function, and we go through the other hash function. Each hash function generates an index into this bit vector, and we're going to set those bits to 1. If these two bits are set to 1, it means that the element that maps to these two bits uh, using these hash functions is present in the, bit vector, uh, in the set. Let's say we insert y. y maps to two different places going through these hash functions, so we're going to set those also to 1. Let's say we test x. Is x present? When you get a cache miss, we test x. We go through the same hash functions, and hash functions are deterministic, so they map to the same bits that x mapped when we inserted x into the Bloom filter. So those are, both of them are 1, which means that the presence test is satisfied, so uh, x exists in the Bloom filter. Now let's say we test for z. We test for z, one of the hash functions mapped to an element that's 1. The other hash function maps to an element that's 0. This means that z is not present. Because for an element to be present in the Bloom filter, both of the bits need to be set. And you can imagine having more hash functions, right? That enables better accuracy in the Bloom filter. Let's say we test for w. w happens to map to a bit that's set with the hash function 1. It also happens to map to another bit that's set with hash function 2. But we never inserted w, right? Remember? Well, it's happened that the Bloom filter told us we did insert w because it happened to map to bits that were set by x and set by y. So this is called a false positive. We're going to have a false positive. We won't have a false negative, meaning that if you insert an element, you'll find it. But if you did not insert an element, you may also find it. And you can, you can trade off between the space and hash functions to minimize the false positive rate in a Bloom filter. But this is a beautiful structure that approximates uh, set representation. Two minutes, okay. I'll go for two minutes and then we'll take a break so that we can record. So that's the idea. This is actually useful in many, many different uh, uh, domains, especially in hardware. And I'm going to use it next, uh, next week in some other implementation uh, that we've done. Okay, let's call the false positive. So uh, let's take a look at another thing, remove. Let's say we want to remove an element. 
Well, if you want to remove an element, you can go through the hash functions. Let's say we want to remove x. You can go through the hash functions uh, and map to uh, two different elements that we inserted. But this may remove multiple addresses, right? Because you're not removing only x, but you're removing everything else that was inserted that happened to map to those locations. So there is no single element to remove in a balloon filter. You can remove bits, but that may remove many elements. But there's a clear function. You can actually clear the entire Bloom filter that gets rid of all of the set. Uh, right? And we're going to use this function to get rid of thrashing, to get reduce thrashing in the system. OK, so how do you implement evicted address filter using a Bloom filter? Basically, we're going to insert an evicted block address, which is going to set some bits. We're going to test when we get a missed block address, which is going to look up the bits. And we're going to remove the thing, uh, the, the block address, if the test is positive. If it's present, we're not going to be able to do this. And we're going to remove an address when the evicted address filter is full. So when you have a Bloom filter, you cannot do these remove operations. So we're going to get rid of them. Instead, when the Bloom filter is full, we're going to clear. So we're not going to remove the address if it hits in the Bloom filter, even though we're going to insert it into the cache. And it turns out this is going to help us with thrashing. So we found that while actually exploring the design space, we didn't think of this initially. But that's how this uh, evolved, clearing the evicted address filter and not removing the address if it hits in the Bloom filter. It turns out it uh, handles thrashing much better. So it turns out Bloom filter uh, based EAF has a 4x reduction storage overhead. Uh, the overhead is 1.47% compared to the cache size. And I guess I'll stop now so that you can switch the tape. Okay. Any? Any questions on this while we stop for a while? Is this all interesting? OK, good. We can continue with caching then today. Oh, is it done? OK. OK, now I've given you the design of uh, evicted address filter. Now let's take a look at uh, the thrash resistance. I've given you the reuse prediction. But we didn't really talk about thrash resistance as much. And the design choices that we made with the balloon filter actually lead to uh -oh, a nice uh, thrash resistant mechanism. OK, I guess I went, went back too far. Yeah, these design choices uh, lead to a thrash resistant mechanism. Let's take a look at thrashing happens when you have a large working set, right? And there are two cases when you have an evicted address filter. One case could be uh, your, the working set of the program can be greater than the cache, but it could be less than cache plus evicted address filter put together. Remember, we're clearing the evicted address filter when it becomes full. What does it mean to become full? Well, it depends on how many things you insert into the evicted address filter. And we're, we're going to vary that also. But your working set can be in between. Let's take a look at how this thrashing happens. Uh, the second case, well, we're going to look at this thrashing also. In this case, the working set can be larger than both the cache and the evicted address filter together. And you could have a, a cyclic reference pattern that thrashes the cache in both cases. Let's take a look at the first case. This is the sequence of addresses that we have. Basically, you have high reuse blocks. That's what thrashing is. Uh, that you keep referencing this way, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, dot, 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 and all the way to L, and you repeat that access pattern. And if you look at this, A, B, C, D is evicted to evicted address filter after a while. If you have a naive evicted address filter mechanism without the Bloom filter implementation, what would happen is A uh, would miss in the cache, in this case, and B would, miss in the, uh, would be inserted into the cache, B, uh, and we would remove A from the evicted address filter. B would miss in the cache, hidden the EAF, and we would insert B into the cache with high priority, removed from the evicted address filter, and so on. So this is what would happen. We would get all cache misses again, because we're thrashing the cache again. Whereas if you have a Bloom filter implementation, this is what would happen. A would miss in the cache. It would hit in the evicted address filter. And we're going to put A uh, at, as high priority into the cache, but we're going to keep A in the evicted address filter, because we cannot remove A right, from the Bloom filter. B, same thing. 
We're going to insert B as high priority into the cache, but we're not going to remove B. We're going to insert D, uh, E, F, G, H into the evicted address filter. Now evicted address filter became full. Right. Now we're going to clear the evicted address filter. And when we access E, F, G, H over here, we'll find that it's not, they're not present in the evicted address filter. As a result, uh, they're not going, uh, well, we're going to miss them because we're not, and we're not going to insert them as high priority into the cache. They're going to be inserted as low priority into the cache and they're going to be evicted. And later, we're going to have access I, that's also not present. Well, it's present in the evicted address filter, but it's going to be inserted as high priority. But everything else will hit in the cache because these are all present because we didn't remove them from the cache because we cleared the evicted address filter. So this way we can mitigate crashing because we clear the evicted address filter. We don't keep, we don't think these blocks that do not fit in the cache uh, are actually uh, going to be all inserted into the cache. Okay. The second case, uh, we're going to, uh, in this case, uh, the working set is greater than both the cache and EAF together. The problem is all blocks are predicted to have low reuse in this case because Whenever you, get, you hit A, it's too late, right? It's not an evicted address filter anymore. So we would like to allow a fraction of the working set to stay in the cache. So we're going to use previous works, which use bimodal insertion policy, uh, insert only a few of the, the blocks at the MRU position. So this doesn't get handled with clearing of the evicted address filter because the working set is too large in this case. And I'll let you think about the rest. So the final design is this. You have the cache and you have a structure on the side with the bloom filter and the counter. Uh, on a cache eviction, we insert the address into the filter, increment the counter. On a cache miss, we test if the address is present in the filter. If yes, we insert at MRU position. Otherwise, we insert with the bimodal insertion policy. High probability, uh, with high probability in the LRU position, with low probability at the MRU position. And when the counter reaches the maximum value, maximum value of elements you can hold, or we would like to hold in the bloom filter, we clear the filter and the counter. Let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of this approach. One advantage is it's simple to implement. So we don't actually change the cache structure, assuming that you already have uh, a mechanism to insert at different positions in the cache. There is no change that's made to the cache. And this is actually a good thing. If you design mechanisms that doesn't change the cache structure, that's nice. We are operating independently of the cache structure on the side. Uh, while we're dependent, we get connections, but we're not changing the cache structure itself. In the previous mechanism, MLP where cache replacement, we were changing the cache structure, right? We were using the tax store. We're changing the tax store. It's easy to design and verify. That's the hope, because bloom filter is an approximate structure. And it works well with other techniques, with replacement policy uh, techniques, uh, as, as the paper shows. The one disadvantage here is if you have an application that's friendly to LRU, least recently used, uh, on the first access, you get a cache miss because you need you check the evicted on the first access, you definitely get a cache miss and it's not in the evicted address filter. So you insert the block with low priority. And later, the second access comes and you get a cache miss again. Whereas if you had inserted the block with high priority, it would be cache hit. Right. So this is bad for LRU friendly applications because LRU friendly applications now incur additional miss for most blocks. So you can actually reduce this by having set sampling, the idea that we've described. Uh, it's called also dueling. Uh, other people have renamed it later on. But uh, basically, you can have auxiliary tag directory. You can implement two policies. One is evicted address filter-based policy, and the other is LRU. And you can pick the one that's doing better. And there's no, I don't like this mechanism, but there's no better way of fixing this problem, I think. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at an evaluation, evaluation of this. Again, this is a simulated system. You can look at the paper for details. Uh, but there are a bunch of workloads that we evaluated this with. And the L3 cache size is varied from one megabyte to 60 megabyte. The prior works, I'll just give you a brief idea of what are the prior works. People have looked at bypassing the cache. Uh, basically, this provides a mechanism for memory, re memory region-based reuse. You divide the memory into regions and try to predict the reuse of each region. If the reuse is high, insert it with high priority. If the reuse is low, bypass the cache. Uh, and other people have looked at uh, program counter-based reuse prediction that I briefly described earlier. You classify the reuse based on the program counters. 
And other people have looked at uh, keeping track of one most recently evicted block and based on that changing the replacement policy. And we compare to all of these different policies. These policies have no control on the number of blocks inserted with high priority. They have uh, thrashing and some of them don't have per block prediction. Uh, to address cache thrashing, uh, these mechanisms uh, try to figure out which applications are actually thrashing the cache and they try to uh, not have those applications in the cache. That's the idea. And bimodal insertion policy is one of these policies here. These mechanisms usually don't have a way of filtering low reuse blocks, so they lead to pollution. They, even though they handle thrashing, they do not handle pollution very well. So these are all these different mechanisms. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but these, uh, the yellow one and the black one, uh, this is evicted address filter, and this is the evicted address filter that dynamically selects between LRU and evicted address filter. And these are results average across uh, different cores, and I believe there are a bunch of applications uh, that we will see in the next few slides. And this is the performance improvement of different mechanisms over LRU. So as you look at this, as the number of cores increases, the performance benefit of uh, more efficiently utilizing the cache actually increases. That's expected because you have a lot more contention in the cache. And also, if you look at this, evicted address filter-based mechanisms provide better performance than the past works. With one core, the performance improvements are relatively low because cache is not a big, uh, it is still a big problem, but it's not as big of a problem, right? With, bigger, uh, with more cores, this problem is going to get much worse because of the contention. So the takeaway is evicted address filter-based mechanisms perform better than previous mechanisms because of the per block prediction, as well as handling pollution and thrashing together. Uh, this, is, this is actually called the S-curve. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but if, uh, this basically looks at all of the workloads that we've evaluated for four core, and this y-axis shows the weighted speed up improvement over least recently used policy, and I'm showing this for evicted address filter, and the workloads are sorted based on the performance improvement they get. Workloads that have the highest performance improvement are here, workloads that have the lowest performance improvement are here. And whenever you have a new mechanism and compare it to a baseline, Usually these curves look like an S-curve. That's why it's called S-curve in Intel. Intel likes these plots in general when they design processors. It turns out it's the nature of the beast that this happens to look like an S. So if you look at this, if you blink a little bit, this looks like an S, right? And most mechanisms are like this, interestingly. You get an S-curve like that because there are very few mechanisms that do, do not degrade performance on a general purpose set of applications. But the hope is that there are a lot of applications that gain a lot here. So this is a nice S-curve. You could actually have a very bad S-curve that looks like this, right? <laughs> okay, so most applications actually gain benefit. Some applications lose benefit because actually they're LRU friendly. There are a lot of LRU friendly workloads in the four core mechanism. So having this, I think this is the comparison to this one. It's supposed to be red. This is the best previous mechanism compared to ours. It's program counter-based prediction. So it does pretty well, but it doesn't do as well as evicted address filter. But there are some workloads where it does better, as you can see. So there are these workloads that are LRE friendly that we do not handle well. And if you actually use this uh, dynamic evicted address filter, I don't think you can see it here because of colors. The red is not shown very well. But we can keep track of the performance of evicted address filter and we curb the uh, performance degradation on these workloads. So you can actually get an almost, uh, not an S-curve maybe. <laughs> Still kind of looks like an S-curve a little bit. <laughs> okay, what is the effect of cache size? As expected, as you increase the amount of cache, the effectiveness of um, more efficient cache management reduces, right? As you increase the cache size to 16 megabytes, the performance improvement you get is much less. But then you're using a lot more cache space uh, also. But the evicted address filter still provides good performance and better performance than previous mechanisms. But again, as you increase the cache size, if you have huge cache, uh, effect, uh, the difference between different mechanisms reduces also. These are all expected. What is the effect of the evicted address filter size? How many blocks should you keep, keep uh, in the evicted address filter? So this is the number of addresses we keep in the evicted address filter divided by the number of blocks in the cache. And it turns out, one-to-one -one ratio is a magic number here. <laughs> Basically, here the performance improvement is low. Here the performance improvement is low again. Here the performance improvement is highest. 
And that's again expected. Well, maybe one exactly is not expected, but uh, something, a curve like this is expected because if you keep lots of blocks in the cache, then you're predicting lots of things as high priority and you're inserting them into the cache. And that's bigger than the cache size. Right? If you keep smaller number of blocks, then you're not utilizing your cache well. You're predicting only a few blocks uh, as high reuse. So this is an expected curve. Okay, there are a bunch of other results in the paper if you're interested. That was part of the uh, reading that I've uh, uh, I provided. But it's the orthogonal to replacement policies, which is a pr characteristic that you would like to have in reuse prediction. And performance improvement increases with memory latency. Uh, that's obvious, probably. And there are uh, this also, performance also improves fairness. Efficient cache utilization usually improves fairness because you're, do you're, you're not keeping bad blocks of an application that doesn't benefit from the cache in the cache. And there are a bunch of alternative designs that perform comparably. Any questions on this? OK. So I think uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly. But basic idea is you keep recently evicted block address in an evicted address filter and use that as a reuse predictor into the cache. And this, act this solution is actually applicable to software caches as well. People have been examining in software caches, and they found similar results that we found, which is interesting. <laughs> 